Hello everyone, my name is Stonesy Boy and welcome back to Reading with Stonesy. Today we are reading chapters 17 to 19, two chapters, and pages 101 to 119. 18 pages. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like every other. Last time, our good friend here made friends with a doggy and met a devil fish. The, de the little doggy's name is Rantu. You know, she she met the dog as any person does, shooting an arrow in their chest and then, you know, getting them back to health for unknown reasons that are beyond my comprehension of what animal love is. The love that you give to your pet dog or pet cat. But that's besides my point. So, without further ado, let's begin. Chapter 17. Storms came early in the rain. Between the rains, fierce winds struck the island, filled the air with sand. During this time, I made myself another dress, but most of the days I spent fashioning a spear to catch the giant devilfish. I had seen the spear made, and I had seen my father make bows and arrows, yet I knew little about it, no more than had the others. Still, I remembered how it looked and how it was used. Some memories from the memories I made after errors and many hours of work, sitting on the floor while round two slept nearby and the storms beat upon the roof. Four of the sea elephant teeth were left, and though I broke all except one, it was worked down to the head with a barbed point. I made a ring and fastened it to the end of the shaft, and into the ring fitted the head, which was tied to a long string made of braided sinew. When the spear was thrown and struck the devil fish, the head came loose from the shaft, the shaft floated in the water, and the point barbed it was held by the string, which tied to your wrist. This spear was especially good because it would be thrown from a distance. On the first day of spring, I went to Coral Cove with my new spear. I knew that it was spring because of the morning dawn and the sky was filled with flocks of darting birds. They were small and black, which came only at the time of year. They came out of the south and stayed for two suns, hunting food in the ravines, and they flew off in one great flight toward the north. Rontu did not go with me to the beach because I had let him out of the fence and he had not returned. Wild dogs had been to the house many times that winter and he had paid no heed to them. But the night before, after he had gone and gone, he had stood at the fence. He stood and whined and walked up and down. He worried me to see him act so strangely, but he refused to eat. I finally let him out. Now I pushed the canoe into the water and drifted toward the reef and the devilfish lived. The water was so clear that it was air around me. Far down the sea, ferns moved through the breeze and blowing there. And among them swam the devilfish, trailing their long arms. It was good for the sea after the winter storms, which the giant spear in my hand. But all the morning, as I hunted the giant devilfish, I kept thinking of Rontu. I should have been happy, yet thinking of him, I was not. Would he come back, I wondered, or had he gone to live with the wild dogs? Would he again be my enemy? If he were my enemy, I knew that I would never kill him, now that he had been my friend. When the sun was high, I hid the canoe in the cave I had found. For once, more there was time when the galoots made return with two small bass I had speared through and not the giant devilfish. I went up the cliff. I had planned to make a trail from the cave to my house, but I decided that it would be in my ship and by anyone standing in the headland. The climb was steep as I reached the top. I paused for breath. The mo morning was quiet except for the noise of the little birds flying from bush to bush and the cries of the gulls, who did not like these strangers. When I heard the sound of dogs fighting, the sound came from far off, perhaps from a ravine, taking my bow and arrows I heard in that direction. I went down the path which led to the spring. There was tracks of wild dogs around the spring. Among them I saw large ones of Rontu. The tracks led away through the ravine which rinds the sea. And I heard again the distant sound of fighting. I went slowly through the ravine because of my bow and arrows. At last, I came to the place where it opens the meadow right at the edge of the low sea cliff. Sometimes in the summers, a long time ago, my people had lived there. They gathered shellfish and rocked and ate them there, leaving the shells which, after many summers, had formed and mounded and mound over the grass had grown and the thick-leaved plant called ganapan. In the mound among the grasses of the plant stood Rontu. He stood facing me with his back to the sea cliff. In front of him was a half circle where the wild dogs at first I thought the pack had driven them against the cliff and were ready to attack him. But I soon saw that the two dogs stood out of the rest of the pack. Between it and Rontu, the muscle muzzles were wet with blood. One of the dogs of the leader who had taken Rontu's place when he had come to live with me. The other one which was spotted I had never seen. The battle was between Rontu and these two dogs. The rest were all to fall upon whichever was beaten. So great was the noise by, made by the pack. They did not hurt me as I came through the brush, nor did they see me now as I stood at the edge of the meadow. They sat on their hunches and barked, with their eyes fixed on the others, but I had sure that Rontu knew I was somewhere near, for he raised his head and smelled the air. The two dogs were trotting back and forth along the foot of the mound, watching Rontu. The fight had probably started at the spring, which they had docked him to his place, where he had chosen to fight. The sea cliff was behind him, and he would not reach them in the direction they were trying to find in another way. It would not have been easier if one could have attacked them from the back and one from the front. 
Ronto did not move from where he stood on top of the mound. Now and again, he lowered his head to lick the wound on his leg, but whenever he did, he always kept his eyes on the two dogs trotting up and down. I have not shot them, for they were within reach of my bow or driven off the pack, yet I stood at the brush and watched. This battle between them and Ronto, if I stopped it, they would surely fight again, perhaps at some other place less favorable to him. Ronto again licked his wound, and this time he did not watch the two dogs moving slowly past the mound. I was sure it was a lure, and it so it proved to be, for suddenly they ran toward him. It came from the opposite sides of the mound, ears laid back and teeth barred. Ronto did not wait for the attack, but leaping at the nearest one, turning his shoulder and with his head lower, caught the dog's foreleg. The pack was quiet in the silence. I could hear the sound of bone breaking, and the dog backed away in three legs. The spotted dog had reached the top of the mound, whirling away from one of the he had crippled. Rontu faced him, but not in time to fend off of the first heavy rush. Teeth slashed at his throat, and as he turned his body, struck him against the flank as he went down. At the moment, he lay there in the grass, with the dog circling warily in the pack, moving slowly toward him, without knowing what I do, what I did. So I fit an arrow and a bow. A good distance separated Rontu and his attacker, and I could end the battle before he was wounded further, and the pack fell upon him. Yet, as before, I did not send the arrow. Spotted dog paused and turned in his tracks. I again leaped, this time from behind. Rontu was still laying in the grass and his paw under him. I thought he did not see what the others was upon him, but crouching there, he suddenly raised himself and same time fastened his teeth in the dog's throat. Together, they rolled to the mound, yet Rontu did not let go. The pack sat restless in the grass, and in the short time, Rontu rose to his feet and left the spotted dog where it lay. He walked to the top of the mound and lifted his head and gave a long howl. I had never heard this sound before. It was a sound of many things I did not understand. He trotted past me and up the ravine. I, when I got to the house, he was there waiting as if he had not been away for some nothing had happened. And all the time he lived, Rontu never left again, and the wild dogs, which for some reason divided into two packs after that, never returned to the headland. Chapter 18 Flowers were plentiful at spring, because of the winter's heavy rains. The dunes were covered with mats and sand flowers, were red and have tiny eyes that were sometimes pink and sometimes white. Yuccas grew tall among the rocks of the ravine. Their heads were clustered with girly globes no longer than pebbles and lower of the sun when it rises. The lupines grew when the springs ran from the sunny cliffs and crevices where one would think anything could grow and the sprang the little red-yellow fountains of the comal bush. Birds were plentiful too. There were many hummers which can stand still in the air, look like bits of polished stone, and have long tongues to sip honey with. There were blue jays which were quarrelsome birds and black and white peckers that pecked holes in the yucca stalks and the holes of the, my roof. Even in the whale bones of the fence, red-winged blackbirds also came flying out of the south, and flocks of crows and birds in the yellow body and the scarlet head, which I had never seen before. A pair of these birds made a nest in the stunted tree near my house. I had made the strings of the yucca bush and, bush and had a small opening at the top and hung down like a pouch. My mother laid two speckled eggs, which she her, and her mate took turns sitting on after the eggs hatched, but I put thread, threads of albaline, albalone under the tree, and these fed her young. The young birds were not like their mother and father, being gray and very ugly, but anyway, I took them from the nest, put them in a small cage, and I made of reed. So later in the spring, when all the birds except the crows left the island and flew off north, I had these two as friends. They soon grew beautiful feathers like those of their parents and began to make the same sound, which was reap, reap. But the soft and clear is much sweeter than the cries of the gulls and the crows and the talk of the pelicans, which sound like the quarreling of toothless old men. Before summer came, the cage was too small for my two birds, but instead of building a large one, I cut the tips of their wings, one wing of each, so they would not fly away, and let them loose in the house. By the time their wings had grown out, they had been learned to take food from my hand, and they would jump down from the roof, perched in my arm, and beg, and making their reap reap sound. When their wings began to feather out, I cut them again. This time, I let them loose in the yard, where they hopped around hunting food, perching on Rontu, who by now had gotten used to them. Next time they feathered out, I did not trim their wings, but they never flew farther away than the ravine, and would always come back at night and sleep, and no matter how much they had eaten to ask for food. No one, because he was lodger, I called Tainor, and named him after a young man I liked who had been killed by the Aleuts. The other I named Luari, which was a name I wished I had been called instead of Karana. During the time I had taming the birds, I have another skirt. I made another skirt. This one I also made of yucca fiber, softened in the water, and braided into roof twine. I made it just like the others, with folds running lengthwise. I was open on both sides and hung to my knees. The belt I made of seal skin, which he tied in a knot. I also made a pair of sandals from seal skin for walking over the dunes when the sun was hot, or just as dressed up when I wore my new shirt of yucca twine. Often, I put on the skirt and sandals and walking to the cliff of Rontu. Sometimes I made the wreath of flowers and fastened it in my hair. 
After the Aleuts had killed our men in the Coral Cove, all the women are tried to sing this short as a sign of mourning. I had singed mine, too, with a fagot, which now have grown long again and came to my waist. I parted it and let it fall down to my back, except with this war, the reef, when I made braids and fastened them to long whalebone pins. I also made a wreath of Rontu's neck, which he did not like, whether he would walk along the cliff looking in the sea, though the white man's ship did not return in the spring. It was happy time. The air smelled of flowers and birds sang everywhere. Chapter 19. Another summer had come, and I had not speared the giant devilfish that lived near the cave. Every day during the spring, Rontu and I went to look for him, but I put the canoe in the water, paddled slowly through the cave. From one opening to the other, often several times, I saw the many devilfish where there were black water that streaked with the light, but not the giant one. At last, I gave up looking for him and began to gather abalones for the winter. The red shells hold the sweetest meat and are best for drying, though the green ones and the black are also good. Because of the red ones are the sweetest, starfish prey upon them. The star-shaped creature places itself over the shell of an abalone, abalone with its five arms spread against the rock to which the abalone was fastened. It holds the shell in which it suckers and then begins to shift itself. The starfish pulls against the abalone shell, sometimes for days holding on to it as the sucker is pushing up its legs until little by little the heavy shell comes loose from the body. One morning we left the cave and paddled out to the reef which jo is joined to it. For many days I have been gathering a new shellfish on the, new on the rocks at Coral Cove. I have been watching the reef and waiting for the right time to harvest. This is when there are few starfish feeding and they are hard to pry loose from the abalone as an abalone was pried from the rock. The tide was low and the reef rose far out in the water. Along its sides were the great numbers of red abalones and very few starfish. For before the sun was high, I filled the bottom of the canoe. The day was windless and since I had not could carry the tide of the canoe, which ran to following me, climbed onto the reef to look to for spear, fish to spear for our supper. The do blue dolphins were leaping beyond the kelp beds and the kelp otter were playing their games that they never tired of. And around me everywhere were golds were fishing for scallops, which were numerous in the summer. They grow in the floating kelp leaves, and there are so many of them, such of the kelp near the reef have been dragged to the bottom. Still, there were scallops the gulls could reach, and taking them in their beaks, would they fly far above the reef and let them drop. The gulls would swoop down on the rocks and pick the meat in the broken shell. Scallops fell in the reef like rain, which amused me, but not Rontu, who could not understand what the gulls were doing. Dodging this way and that, I went to the end of the reef where the biggest fish live. With the sinew line of the hook, I made the abalone shell. I caught two in a large heads and long teeth, but are good to eat. I gave one to Rontu, and on the way back to the canoe, gathered purple sea urchins for use for dying. Rontu, who was trotting along in front of me, suddenly dropped the fish and stood looking down over the edge of the reef. There, swimming in the clear water, was the devilfish. It was the same one I'd been hunting for. It was a giant. Seldom did you see the devilfish here, but they like deep places, and the water along this part of the reef is shallow. Perhaps this one lived in the cave and came here only when he could not find food. Rontu made no sound. I fixed his head to a spear and a long string, which I held to my wrist. He had been then crawled back to the edge of the reef. The giant had not moved. He was floating just below the surface of the water, and I could plainly see his eyes. They were the size of small stones and stood from the head, with black rims and gold centers in the centers of the black spot, like the eyes of the spear when once in the night and the rain fell and lightning forked the sky. But my hands rested as the deep crevice in its fish was hiding. The giant was half the length of my spear from the reef. But while I watched, one of his long arms ran out like a snake, and it felt his way into the crevice, which was past the fish and along the side of the rock. When the end of it curled back, the arm gently wounded itself from the fish from behind. I rose to one knee and drove the spear. I aimed for the giant's head, but though it was larger than my two fishes and a good target, I missed. The spear struck down in the water and slanted off, and suddenly a black cloud shrouded the devil fish. The only thing I could see him was the long arm still grasping his prey. I jumped to my feet and pulled the spear, thinking that I might have a chance to throw it again. But as I did, the shaft bobbed back of the surface. I saw the barbed point had come loose. At the same moment, the string tightened. My grip on it broke. And aware I had struck the devil fish, I quickly dropped the coils and ha I held. For when the string runs out fast, it burns your hand and becomes untangled. The devil fish does not swim with fins or flippers like other things in the sea. It takes water and through the hole in front of the body and pushes the water out behind with its two slits. And when he is swimming slowly, you can see these two streams trailing out. But only then... Then he moves fast, so you can see nothing except the streak in the water. The coils I had dropped in the rock hopped and sang as they ran, and there were two, m no more of them. The string tightened on my wrist and lessened to a shock. I leaped across the crevice in the direction the giant had taken. With the string in both hands and still fastened to my wrist, I braced my feet in the slippery rock and leaned backwards. 
The string snapped right and the weight of the jellyfish. I began to stretch, and fearing it might break, I walked forward, yet I made him pull me every step. He was going toward the cave along the edge of the reef. The cave was a good distance away. I got there. I would surely lose him. The canoe was tied and just in front of me. Once I was in it, I could let him pull me until I grew tired. But there was no way to untie the canoe and still hold onto the string. Rontu was still all the time was running up down the reef, barking and leaping at me, which made my task harder. Step by step, I walked forward until the devilfish was in the deep water close to the cave. He was so close that I had to stop, even if the sinew broke I, and I lost him. I therefore braced myself and did not move. The sinew stretched, throwing off the drops of water. I could hear it stretch, but I was sure it would break. I did not feel it cutting into my hands, though they bled. The pull suddenly lessened as I was sure he was gone. In the next instance, I saw the string cutting the water in the wide circle. He was swimming off from the cave and the reef towards some rocks, and there was twice the length of the string away. He would be safe there too, for among them were many places to hide. I pelted myself half the string while he was moving toward the rock, but soon I had to let it go. It grew tight and again began to stretch. The water there was only a little over my waist, and I helped let myself down over the reef. There was a sandbar not far from the rocks, and stepping carefully at the bottom, which were full of holes, I slowly made my way toward it. Ronchi swam along by side. I reached for the sandbar before the devilfish could hide himself in the rocks. The string held and turned himself, um, and once more swam around the cave. Twice again, he did, th he did this. Each time, I took some of the string. Third time, he came up into the shallow water. I walked backward across the sandbar so he would not see me and pulled on the string with all my strength. The giant slid up in the sand. He laid his arms and spread out partly in the water. He, I thought he was dead. When I saw his eyes moving, therefore I would not shout a warning. Rontu had rushed forward and seized him, but the devilfish was too heavy to lift or shake. As Rontu's jaws thought another hold, three of many arms wound themselves around his neck. The devilfish are only dangerous in the water where they can fasten themselves to you in their long arms. These arms have rows of suckers beneath them, and they could drag you under and hold you there until you drown. But even on the land, the devilfish can injure you, for he is strong and does not die quickly. The giant was flailing his arms, struggling to let back in the water. Little by little, he was dragging Rontu with him. I could no longer use the string because it would wound around Rontu's legs. The whalebone knife I used for prying albalones from the rocks had tied, along thong, uh, tied to a thong at my waist. The blade was thick at the point and a sharp edge. I dropped my coil of string and I fastened the knife as I ran. I ran past the devil fish and got between him and the deep water. So many of his arms were flailing around, it was useless to cut any one of them. One struck me in the leg and burned like a whip. Another, which Rontu had chewed off, lay rigged on the edge of the water, as if it were looking for something to fasten onto. The head rose out of the twisting arms like a giant stalk. The gold eyes or black rims were fixed on me. Above the sounds of the waves were water splashing and Rontu's barking. I could hear the snapping of his beak, which was sharper than a knife I held in my hand. I drove the knife down into his body, and as I did this, I suddenly covered, for it seemed a countless number of leeches sucking at my skin. Fortunately, one hand was free and held had and the hand that held the knife, and again and again I struck down through the tough tide. The suckers, which were fastened onto me, pained greatly less in their hold. Slowly, the arms stopped moving and then grew limp. I dragged the, the devilfish out of the water, but my strength was gone. I did not even go back to the reef for my canoe, though I had to make, take this shaft and the head of the spear, which had cost me much labor in the sinew line. It was night before Rontu and I got back to the house. Rontu had a gnash on his nose from the giant's beak, and I had many cuts and bruises. I saw two more giant devilfish along the reef that summer, but I did not try to spear them. Wow. She did it. She actually did it. She defeated the devilfish, and Rontu defeated his, uh, well, I guess his old bandmates. But, you know, that doesn't matter. What does matter is today we read chapter 17 to 19 pages 101 to 19 uh-oh that's some bad news because next time we're reading only chapters 20 to 22 and pages 120 to 140 so we are back to the 20 pages which honestly shouldn't be that bad considering we've been you know weaning ourselves back up to the fight of of 12 12 uh 18 12 16 18 which was this episode so, you know, that's not bad. That shouldn't be that bad. At least on my voice. And only two chapters. So, you know, 10 pages. I get a break. 10 chapters. It shouldn't be that bad. Um, Next episode's going to kind of suck, though, because it's going to be 22 pages, but also there's going to be five chapters. So, you know, 50-50 on that. But, yeah. So, that is it for the Island of the Blue Dolphins. Now, let's all walk into the corner, grab our hands on our knees, sit in the corner while the party's popping, and... Grab our books because it's time for the
learning corner of the day or Stonesy's learning corner. Today we are learning about one of the longest titles of a dog and I'm also going to try to keep the trend of a baby version of the dog and an adult. I hope that's a new thing that you guys like. Today we are learning about the Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retriever. Long name, it's better have a long history. It's a very long, long, dumb name. Nova Scotia Duck Trolling Retriever. Who has a name like that? But of course, before you can make fun of anything, you have to know about the history, ladies and gentlemen. You should all know this by now. I mean, it's a very nice looking dog. He has a little sword for chest hair. I mean, that's pretty manly. And then that one has a rope. He's manly-er, even though he's a baby. He's a little bubby. He's a little stupid loopy doopy. And he has a little monocle eye and a little white thing on his nose. He's great. But he's also a little dumb. And he has little shoes on. Look at that. Little shoes. Little paws that are shoes. But of course, we need another history before I can say more. The history of the Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever is pretty long. Europeans has used dogs to toll, Middle English meaning to lure or decoy, ducks into nets since the 17th century. Tolling is one done by dogs frolicking along the shore, chasing sticks and occasionally disappearing from sight, an activity that draws curious ducks into the area. The tolling dog must continue its animated fashion, tail wagging, retrieve after retrieve, ignoring the ducks. With its advent of guns, the ducks were in the shot and the dogs went to retrieve them. Such decoy dogs may have come to the European settlers in the New World where they were used to toll in cheap Chesapeake, uh, Chesapeake Bay at the Marine Times. The Nova Scotia duck trolling retriever was, was developed in the Yarmouth County at the southern tip of Nova Scotia. In the near early 19th century, it perhaps later crossed with Spaniel, Setter, and Retriever-type dogs, as well as farm collies. And an alternative theory is that they're derived in part from the tolling American Indian dogs, originally known as the Little River Duck Dog, or the Yarmouth Toller. The breed later became known as the Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retriever. It was recognized by the Canadian Kennel Club, or the KCK, in the 1915 and 15th tollers registered that year. The first tollers came to the United States in the 1960s, and it wasn't until 1984 that the Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retriever Club, USA, was formed. The club offered a breed companionship that required basic retrieving and tolling ability with order to qualify, and still offers a series of working certificates to ensure that the breeds and stink remain intact. In 2001, tollers were admitted into the AKC, or the American Kennel Club, miscellaneous class, and were admitted as a regular member of the sporting group in 2003. Since then, they have proven they are more than just trollers and retrievers, but excel in obedience, agility, tracking, and of course, companionship. So wow, these dogs did a little bit of trolling, or I guess tolling, as it was. And they would troll the little duckies, and they'd go, why is, it, why is he doing that? Quack, quack, quack. And then the guys with the gun would go, boom! And then they were like, okay, I go pick up duck now. da dee da dee da dee da so These dogs did a little bit of trolling. I think the only dog breed that I know of that does do a little bit of trolling. So yeah. That's pretty cool. But now, you want a little bit of a trollster in your home, because apparently, he's a good companion. So, what are the temperament of these dogs? What, is it going to attack my kids? Is it easily angry? Well, the temperament of the <gasps> Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retriever is that as a benefiting of a dog breed that play and retrieve tirelessly, the toller is very energetic and playful. You cannot throw a ball at once for a toller. Everything they do is done with gusto, whether it's hunting, obedience, agility, or just walking around the block with a Glock. They are alert but not hyperactive and just can adjust to many circumstances. They are affectionate and gentle. But young tollers can be overly boisterous at times. They are good with children, other dogs, pets. Oh, I'm sorry. And pets. Tollers may be instantly wary of strangers, but warm up quickly. They learn fast and are generally willing to please, but bore easily and then can be a bit stubborn. Sorry about that. I had to take a phone call. Now, these silly dogs can be a bit stubborn and very boisterous, but, you know, you gotta keep them entertained, people. So this is not necessarily the family dog. This is more of a, I'm, my name is John Mitchell. And I live in the forest, and I'm out there. I don't know who John Mitchell is. If your name is John Mitchell, comment below. And if you do, you get a free Dog Day Stonesy Boy sticker. I don't know who John Mitchell is, and I don't have Dog Day Stonesy Boy stickers, so that's fine. Um, Maybe I'll make them. Maybe if I get enough love for these, I'll start making dog, I'll start making dog uh, merch. That sounds funny. Making money off doggies. But... Yeah, so now you know about them. They're a bit boisterous, if 
and stubborn if they're not given enough attention. Yada yada. So what is the upkeep of these dogs? I, as a parent, know that my kid isn't going to do anything for these dogs. So what, what, what do I got to do? What do I, as a parent, or I have to teach my kid about this dog to keep him up at night? Well, the upkeep of the <gasps> Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever is that the tollers need a lot of exercise, especially involving playing and retrieving. They love water. Tollers are also a profit for mental challenges, such as obedience and agility. They have devoted family companions that treasure their interaction with humans. So even though they are physically able to withstand the right variety of climates, mentally, they need to spend mo some time with their time indoors. They do not cope well with being kenneled outside. Grooming consists of thorough weekly brushing. So every day you wake up and you grab the brush you have and brushy brushy. Then you go and brush them and then you brush them and brush them. And then you can play with them all day. They don't like being outside, so do not kennel your dogs outside. Do not kennel the Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever or those. They're going to do a little trolling on you. So, yeah. Now, for the worst part, the health. Little kids, kids listening to this, cover your ears, because health is always a scary part that you don't need to learn about yet. For the adults or teenagers, keep your ears peeled. For the health, the major concerns of the Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever are none. Nothing that you need to watch out that can, you know, hurt this doggy in one cinch. So that's good. The minor concerns are CHD or PRA. So, you know, the eyes and such. Um, the occasionally seen with nothing. So these dogs are relatively healthy. Um, the suggested tips, the suggested tests, I'm sorry, are the hips and eyes. So, you know, you're going to want to keep an eye on those. Or you should keep a hip and an eye on those, you know. Sorry, I sneezed. Um, uh, <laughs> the form and function of these little doggies. I don't have a family. So what, what do these dogs do for me, you know? I think I'm coming down with a cold. I keep doing these audiobooks and opening my mouth and all these beautiful little germs and parasites go, ah, yum, 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 yum. And or I, like, I, I think I'm doing the yum, yum, yum part, but they're just going in and be like, oh, I love you. Now. And, you know, so yeah. <clears throat> The form and function of the Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever is that because tollers run as much as they swim when hunting, they are smaller and more agile than most other retrievers. Their powerful yet compact build enables them to rush around tirelessly, leaping and retrieving with tall, with tail always wagging. The jaw are strong enough to carry a duck because they were bred to work in icy waters. They have water repelling double coat at medium length. A longer coat is not appropriate for a working dog, although the tail feathering could be long. Adding the emphasis of the wagging tail, the white blaze chest, tall tip, and the feel is characteristic. They may serve and make the dogs gam gamboling more noticeable or distancing ducks. So basically, as a person who just wants to keep an eye on this dog and wants to know the proper schematics of them, uh, they don't have very they have good enough hair to not get you know very very wet. But you make sure you got to make sure their hair isn't very long or else that could be bad. <laughs> now, for the final part of this is at a glance, which is a five tier, um, five tier bar consisting of these five tiers. Tier five means it's either the best or it could be the worst, depending what we're scoring. Four means it's better than average, you know. Oh, you're better than the average puppy dog. Uh, you know, or it could be worse than the average puppy dog, depending on the situation. Three is average. Oh my goodness, you are average. You are like that doggy over there. You're completely average. You're just like every other dog. Two could be worse than average, which could be good or bad. It could be low or high on the schematometer. And one is you're the worst. You suck. You're not good. Now, for a doggy, that's sad. So you got to still give him a lot of kisses. And because of a dog having one in something does not mean it won't have higher attributes than everything else. Because people love dogs, I love dogs. So just because something has a one tier does not, don't make it think it's bad. Now, for the at a glance. The energy level roofs, exercise requirements, playfulness, affection level, friendliness towards dogs, and friendliness over the, towards other pets is a five. Now this dog is big muscle, big playing, energy, loves people, loves other pets, loves other dogs. He, he's great. He's everyone's best friend, apparently. Except... Towards strangers, the friendliness towards strangers is a three. Now he, you're average, you know. Oh, well, you're cool if my owner says you're cool. Is he cool? Yeah. Okay. Good. Now the ease of training is a four. This is fantastic for a dog. 
because it's so it's easier than average to train this dog you know roll over pet do a flip do a backflip good dog that type of thing now for the watchdog ability protection ability and grooming requirements these are all at a two although i would personally put the grooming requirements of this dog at a three because you have to brush it by every week and maybe once a week or maybe many times a week so i would put that at a three personally but the watchdog ability and protection ability is at a two it can't see worth anything and it can't protect worth anything but hey if you live in a good neighborhood, you should be fine. Now, the cold tolerance of this dog is out of four. This dog could take the cold just fine. I mean, it was literally bred to swim, swim, swim in the water. So, it should be fine. And the heat tolerance of this dog is at a three. Average. Pretty average. I've never seen a dog have a lower cold or hot tolerance than three or four. So, it works out. The weight of the male breed should be about 45 to 52 pounds. For females, it should be 35 to 42 pounds. For the healthy recommended weight of these dogs at a full age of an adult. The height should be around for a male should be around 18 to 21 inches. For a female, 17 to 20 inches for a nice healthy height of the Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retriever. Wow, next episode we're not actually dealing with the retriever. Although we are dealing with a silly looking dog, which is something you will learn about in the next episode so i hope you guys have a super fantastic wonderful day be polite be efficient make sure to like comment and subscribe and without further ado i will see you guys next time Bye bye